as messages from the gods. As supernatural winds that blew from the realm of spirits. Modern science has linked these polar light shows, called auroras, to vast waves of electrified gas hurled in our direction by the sun. Today, researchers from a whole new generation see this dynamic substance, plasma, as an energy source that may one day fuel humanity's expansion into space. What can we learn? And how far can we go? By tapping into the strange and elusive fourth state of matter. A cadre of scientists has come to Fairbanks, Alaska to realize what may seem an impossible dream, to revolutionize space travel. Dr. Ben Longmire and his team from the University of Michigan have designed a whole new type of rocket engine that promises a faster and more efficient way to get around in space. They're here to test components of this rocket by sending them aboard helium balloons to an altitude of 30 kilometers into the harsh environment of space. Above the North and South Poles, conditions are about as harsh as you can get. Our planet is bombarded with a steady stream of charged particles from the sun. Earth's magnetic field accelerates and channels them, turning the night into a spectacle of color. While most astronauts train to live and work in zero gravity or to move around in bulky spacesuits, these would-be space explorers are preparing to negotiate some of Earth's harshest environments. Once they launch their payload, it will rise slowly into the upper atmosphere. After drifting through the night, above 99% of Earth's atmosphere, the payload will detach from the balloon and parachute down to the ground. The team must be prepared to retrieve it across a large stretch of Alaska's snowy wilderness. To understand the revolutionary nature of the idea they are pursuing, we go back to the dawn of rocketry. In over a hundred years, the technology of a rocket has hardly changed. Fill a cylinder with volatile chemicals. Contact! Yes, contact! Then ignite them in a controlled explosion. The force of the blast 
is what pushes the rocket up. Six. Nowadays, chemical rockets are the only ones with enough thrust to overcome Earth's gravity and carry a payload into orbit. But they're not very efficient. The heavier the payload, the more fuel a rocket needs to lift it into space. But the more fuel a rocket carries, the more fuel it needs. One of the fabled Saturn V rockets of the Apollo era, for example, weighed in at 177,000 kilograms. Filled up with fuel, it weighed almost 16 times that. The space shuttle, with maximum payload, weighed about 100,000 kilos. Add tanks and fuel, and it lifted off at 2 million kilograms. Regardless of weight, for a spacecraft to escape Earth's gravity, it must reach a minimum speed of 40,000 kilometers per hour. The energy needed to do that meant there wasn't enough fuel for a sustained acceleration to more distant planetary shores. Most missions beyond Earth have relied instead on their initial launch speed to coast to their destination. The twin spacecraft of Voyager, for example, did not have enough speed to reach their current positions at the edge of the solar system. To give them a boost, flight planners sent them into Jupiter's gravitational field, using its pull to slingshot them out to Saturn. Voyager 1 used Saturn to accelerate to almost 63,000 kilometers per hour. Voyager 2 got further assists from Saturn and Uranus. Ben's rockets promise far greater gas mileage than traditional chemical rockets, but with enough power to reach distant targets more quickly. The idea is that once in space, his rockets use electricity to create a weak force, which over time can accelerate them to very high speeds. They run on the same fuel that nature uses literally to power the cosmos. Not long after its explosive beginnings, the universe was awash in vast stores of hydrogen gas. But even as the universe continued to expand, gravity drew clumps of matter into ever denser concentrations. The earliest stars took shape, immense balls of hydrogen gas hundreds of times the mass of our sun. As they contracted inward, they heated up and ignited Intense radiation now began to flow through the voids. That had the effect, all through the universe, of stripping electrons away from the primordial gas. The universe became filled not with solids, liquid, or gas, but with a fourth state of matter, plasma. On our planet, Plasma occurs only in rare circumstances. In a hot flame. A bolt of lightning. Or in a blown electrical transformer. Made up of negatively charged electrons and positively charged ions, 
Plasma is in most cases electrically neutral, since the charges balance each other out. That led the physicist Erwin Langmuir in the 1920s to compare it to the clear liquid plasma that carries blood cells through our bodies. The development of radio led to the discovery high above the Earth of a natural plasma ceiling, the ionosphere. It hovers above us, reflecting some radio frequencies and absorbing others. Its importance became clear when engineers noticed that radio waves could, under some conditions, travel beyond our line of sight. They discovered that signals could be bounced deliberately off this conducting layer in what's called skywave propagation. In World War II, a whole new age of global communications came of age when radio was used to execute complex worldwide logistics of troop and ship movements. The presence of the ionosphere is due to a steady stream of charged particles, or plasma, that comes from the sun. A spacecraft with complex computer components must be able to survive constant exposure to these particles. As part of their design process, Ben and his team want to test some of the specialized components of their rockets in the plasma-filled environment of our upper atmosphere. Got it down. I think it's just the sun. Yeah, I think that one's okay. All right. Yeah. I'll wrap the middle one though, or I can just wrap it. I can just. I mean, I just. These components will be mounted on a simple frame attached by rope to a high-altitude balloon. Hold on, they're not oriented the same. The frame is also outfitted with an array of novel sensors to take independent readings. One holds a colony of bacteria. The idea is that the bacteria itself can detect radiation. So it, it mutates in a certain way or in a very known way that when you send it into an environment with uh, a lot of cosmic rays and a lot of um, perhaps x-rays from the aurora itself, um, it mutates, and so we'll detect sort of the level of radiation that it's exposed to um, by looking at these mutations after we recover the bacteria from flying it to the edge of space in these balloon capsules. Another is a series of tiny GoPro cameras converted to record the intensity of infrared and ultraviolet light, normally hidden from the human eye. We want okay. to kind of puff up so we know it's replaced all the air. The team uses argon gas to insulate instruments against the cold. With chemical packets added for warmth. They stabilize the frame with tiny gyroscopes and outfit it with GPS devices for tracking. Cool. <laughs> this team is doing much more than just designing instruments to survive a rain of charged particles. Their goal is to design spacecraft that actually harness the explosive properties of plasma. Unlike most matter on Earth, Plasma conducts electricity and responds to magnetic fields. In space, these properties influence the formation of structures like galaxies and nebulae. 
and they play a role in some of the most violent processes in the universe. such as the formation of a black hole. It forms in the wake of a giant star's death when matter collapses into its core. It swirls in along what's known as an accretion disk. Magnetic fields take shape on the disk, rising and twisting around the polar regions. They draw huge volumes of plasma up, then shoot it out at high speeds. These plasma jets can extend far beyond the largest black holes. You can see them blasting continuously from the centers of galaxies, reaching thousands of light years into space. Studies of one giant nearby ball of plasma show what a complex and volatile substance it can be. In the core of our sun, high heat and crushing pressures cause hydrogen atoms to crash together. That sets off a nuclear reaction in which hydrogen atoms fuse into heavier ones like helium and carbon, generating heat. This heat slowly rises to the surface of the sun in vast plumes of plasma. You can see evidence of this process called convection in a pattern of ever evolving blobs known as granules. They are like the tops of thunderstorms. Even as energy builds within, the sun's gravity and density can stifle its escape. What carries it out are magnetic fields. They twist and wrap around, channeling energy to the surface. The fields can power immense loops of hot gas about 60,000 degrees Celsius, then rise up from the solar surface and fall back. Largest eruptions, called coronal mass ejections, can reach up to three million kilometers per hour as they hurtle out across the solar system. They can literally slam into Earth's own magnetic field. Because solar particles are charged, a portion follows the orientation of Earth's magnetic field lines. Finding an opening at the poles, they race down into the atmosphere. You know this is happening when you see the beautiful lights of the Aurora Borealis in the far north, or the Aurora Australis in the south. They appear when charged solar particles collide with oxygen molecules in the upper atmosphere, causing them to glow blue, red, and green, depending on altitude.
Flying through a zone called the thermosphere, some 350 kilometers above the Earth, astronauts in the International Space Station watch in awe as the aurora shimmers, framed by the glow of stars and cities at night. Back in Michigan, Ben and his team have set up a lab to pioneer a whole new generation of plasma rocket engines. The lab recalls an earlier period of space exploration. It features a giant vacuum chamber built in the 1960s in hopes of winning a contract to test Apollo moon rovers. The chamber has given this small university team the ability to accelerate their research into the physics of plasma and rocket engine design. They are actually part of a larger community of plasma rocket scientists within NASA and within private companies like Ad Astra of Houston, Texas. Because plasma does not occur naturally on Earth, the challenge is to create it, then harness it. The teams inject a gas commonly argon, into a chamber. They bombard it with radio waves, which strip electrons from the gas and turn it into a plasma. The soup of electrons and ions accelerates as it moves through a magnetic field generated by superconducting magnets. A second radio blast heats it up to a million degrees Celsius. That's enough to blast it out and propel a spacecraft. The idea of using plasma to power rockets is not a new one. Over here? Yeah. Okay. Three, two, one. Go! Oh. No spin, look at that. The Polish <laughs> physicist Stanislaw Ulam is said to have been inspired by atom bomb tests in the 1940s. He speculated that waves of plasma from small nuclear detonations could propel a spacecraft to extreme speeds. In the 1950s, that idea animated dreams of exploring the solar system in spacecraft like this 360-ton Mars-bound vehicle. The idea gained funding in the Orion project with the idea of driving a spacecraft with nuclear pulses and landing on Mars in only a month. Concerns about radioactive exhaust helped doom the project. Plasma rockets, energized by nuclear reactions, were revived in the Daedalus and Nerva projects of the 1960s, and again at the beginning of this century, as part of a proposed journey to Jupiter's moon Europa. Rising costs killed that mission.
Newer plasma rocket concepts have switched to solar energy to power their engines. Among the most ambitious, the Dawn mission was sent into orbit 